Welcome back. I'm Brandon, the HBAR Bull, once again joined by Zepsi. We both do some contract work for the HBAR Foundation, but we don't do these weekly updates in any official capacity. We're just coming to you personally to give you the latest in the Hedera ecosystem. Welcome, Zep. How's it going, Brandon? It's going good. We have a lot of really exciting things to get into. But as always, none of this is financial advice. Use it for entertainment or educational purposes only. So the top story today is going to be D-PIN. We have some exciting things going on in the world of Hedera D-PIN. But before we get to that, uh, I want to do a little bit of a dive into some of our HTS tokens. That ecosystem is becoming so vibrant. Of course, we did a really long spot on it last week, but there's going to be continued developments. So I think each week we're going to do some focus on the HTS ecosystem and any developments that might be going on. The first one that I wanted to touch on is the Hedera Hashcoin that you mentioned last week. They had an airdrop associated with one of our very popular NFTs, that's Dead Pixels. That seems like it went off really well, so congratulations to them for that. I got a few of them. I haven't actually looked into my wallet quite yet, but I'm assuming they're there. And I've been told that it worked out just fine. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is BSL. That is the bank social token. It's been around for a while in different forms. It was on the Binance chain. It was also on Ethereum. They've completely ported over from Binance to Hedera. The Ethereum version is still out there. It's been doing well so far in the market in the Hedera DeFi world. But I do want to say that though we've covered bank social a lot, I don't know how this token exactly fits into their framework. And until I do understand something, I'm not going to put money into it. But this is an easy fix. I'm going to talk to John. Uh, we've had John on plenty of times in the past to get the details of exactly how it fits into their framework. And once I do have that information, I may get involved. But it's just exciting to see some of these shifts over from other ecosystems into the Hedera ecosystem. Now, Zepp, you have some other tokens that you're excited about that may not have launched yet, but seem like they have a lot of potential. Can you run through some of those? Yeah, so there's a, a lot of coins you know, on my radar, you know, both ones that we already know of within the ecosystem, but some that are going to you know, make their way over and make their debut. And so one of these first ones that we're aware of is Legends of the Past. You know, Legends of the Past is ran by Baz, straight out of France, a stellar team developing their mobile game on Hedera, X Clash of Clans, X Ubisoft, X Supercell, and, and so on and so forth. So they'll be launching their token, which is, as I understand, you know, integral to the entire economy within that game. So that's definitely one to look out for. Staying within the gaming ecosystem, we've got Astronova. And so Astronova originally began development on Ethereum. They came over to Hedera, citing the scalability of the Hedera token service. And again, they've got their own token, RVV, which again will be an integral part of that in-game economy. So that's on the, the gaming frontier. But then we look over at Kabila, who are one of our leading you know, NFT tooling platforms. They are planning work around their KBL token, Kabila token. And so that's another one that I know they're working from the ground up. They've got some great advisors come in. Actually, someone new at the foundations having you know, conversations with them about tokenomics and this kind of thing. So they've got that really good support network there to make sure that that is carried out as professionally as possible. So that's Legends of the Past, Astronova and Kabila. And so another one is, you know, Severa World, who we covered last week. They're, you know, in partnership with Kuro, which is the biggest sports media channel in the Middle East and MENA region. And they have been discussing the, the launch of their SPT token. As I understand, this is a, a cross-chain token similar to Karate Combat. You know, we saw how Karate Combat's gone, but in the next week or so, I'll be talking to the team. So I'll have more information on that for next week. Yeah, the one cross-chain thing that does make sense to me is uh, Ethereum and Hedera. Ethereum for the liquidity to get on things like Uniswap, and then for usefulness of the token, for using them in applications like Karate Combat does, have the Hedera version and make them as fungible as possible. And for the most part, Karate Combat is fungible. You can withdraw either one you want from like a centralized exchange or something along those lines. And I do want to remind everybody to make sure you participate in the Earthlings drip of P. Steam. That's the precursor to the Steam that they're going to have later on. Earthlings, just like Kabila, are just really engaged with the community. So do your best to engage with them. All right. The next thing we're going to get into is going to cross over between the token world and the deep pin world that we're going to get into a little bit more here. And that's Neuron. So Zep, I heard that Neuron is actually going to have a token. Is that correct? 
Yeah, so, you know, Neuron are one of the strongest deep-in projects in our ecosystem, if not one of the strongest I've actually seen in Web3. You know, they've been on ITV News this week. They've been worked in a pilot with the English government, the British government. They've worked with uh, Vertical Aerospace, which is a leading aero taxi service and so on. They've really been partnering with and doing pilots with some of the leading, leading names within that kind of autonomous vehicle space. And of course, we know that they are absolutely fundamentally tied to the Hedera consensus service for that data logging, for ensuring the flight paths are you know, as safe as possible. But also now they've come out saying that the Hedera token service will be part of their offering. So they will have a, as I understand, an incentives token for people that run their own hotspot to sort of support this, you know, network of drones across the UK initially, and then I believe expanding out. But this is a true deepened network. Deepened networks in Web3 can cover a lot of things, but the ones that, of course, take the most media spotlight are the ones that have those tokens, because both, you know, community members can get involved with their own hotspot, earn tokens, and it has that speculative side, as well as that deep utility side. So... For me, Neuron are a big, big project in the Hedera ecosystem, launching an HCS token, which I'll definitely, definitely be checking more out of. I can't wait to see how we can get involved with Neuron's token. And I actually have a clip from the Neuron footage on ITV that you mentioned. Now, next tonight, a two and a half million pound project to make Falmouth the UK's first drone friendly harbour is running test flights out of the town. The drones would be used to deliver the likes of emergency medicine, food or maintenance supplies. Well, it's already partnered with Royal Mail and the NHS for Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly, as Charlotte Gay reports. There's the drone that your mate flies and then there's this beast. This demonstration in Falmouth Harbour shows how unmanned aircraft in the not-so-distant future will deliver from land to vessels at sea. Uh, Rebecca, and it's the first steps in this Cornish town of becoming the UK's first drone-friendly harbour. You can sort of get your home domestic drones that you can fly around and take cool pictures with, but drone technology is really increasing globally and what the opportunity that we're working on here is making sure that, that can become commercially viable. We've already de been able to demonstrate that you can deliver mail, uh, medical supplies, blood supplies for example for emergency testing, uh, Covid vaccination kits, PPE, the lot. So this is really about how can we Falmouth already be servicing an industry that's passing us but with greater value and ultimately looking for more efficiency in the future. We saw during the Covid years a trial with Royal Mail to deliver packages by drone to the Isles of Scilly. Now in its next phase, Falmouth's maritime industry are being briefed about how this technology works. So this is the battery which powers the aircraft. Super simple. Um, battery comes around and sits into the battery pod bay. Ensure that it's all connected and it seats itself nice and flush with the aircraft. Aircraft will then do its boot up process and um, soon be ready for a flight. And where do you put something in the aircraft? Yeah, of course. So uh, then right behind the battery bay, uh, we have the uh, payload bay. This is where you would have all the uh, medical supplies. We'd have a uh, purpose-built box uh, for the payload. Um, and it was sitting here and then aircraft is good to be sent off. The drone is said to be six times faster, 70% cheaper and an 80% reduction in carbon emissions compared to traditional maritime deliveries. It's anticipated this new world will bring a host of different skilled jobs and need a generation of maritime workers to be trained for a future with these drones. It's a whole new way of doing things, coming in to land. Charlotte Gay, ITB News, Falmouth. And we certainly need to define for anybody that doesn't know what deep in in. We're talking about decentralized physical infrastructure. So, of course, Neuron falls straight into that. Another team that's building on Hedera that falls into that is QuickPick. And I caught up with the founder of QuickPick, Obasi. He had some really interesting things to say. He's bringing the sharing economy together with, you know, parcel delivery. And it reminded me of what Uber's doing. So check out what he has to say. Obasi, welcome. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you. Hi, Brandon. Nice to meet you. Likewise, likewise. So, Obasi, can you tell us about your business and the problems you're trying to solve? Okay, sure. Yeah, so QuickPick is an on-demand delivery as a service platform that allows um, people, particularly businesses and retail customers, to get on-demand delivery services. 
So on our platform, we are able to connect riders, that's vehicle owners, with users who want their packages delivered in real time. And in order to achieve this, we are leveraging um, Hedera service and also Google Maps to be able to track this package movement in real time and also hash them on the blockchain so that every party involved will see how their package is moving and those who need to get paid also see how the payments are also coming in. Thank you. So, Obasi, that kind of sounds like the Uber for package delivery. Is that about right? Yeah, exactly. That's that's what it is. But, but uh, unlike maybe Uber, that, that is, of course, global and, and the rest, we are focusing on Africa because um, until now, there, there have not been like a, a, a very good um, solution that helps to make sure that packages are delivered in real time and safely. So, you know, just like the commerce in Africa, they will tell you that commerce in Africa is fragmented. That's how delivery too is. So oftentimes packages get lost in transit. And um, you, in fact, a lot of the time there is even no insurance. So most times the customer who is making those deliveries are usually on the on the losing side. Yeah, so with Peak Peak, we try to mitigate against those risks and, and get those kind of problems out of the way, yeah. Using technology. That makes perfect sense. And starting in Africa also makes sense. You may kind of leapfrog the rest of the world because we've seen what Uber has done for the taxi industry. Yes. We, we can do the <laughs> same thing and disrupt the package exactly. delivery services as well. Exactly. So you mentioned you use Hedera. How exactly are you using Hedera to enhance your business? Okay, so we are, we are using Hedera in, in multiple um, phase or multiple aspects. So first, we are able to use Hedera to track and hash packages in transit from the request delivery point, from the point when a customer or a business make a delivery request on our platform. From that moment, the transaction is hashed on chain. And what that means is that it's impossible for us to say, hey, you didn't place any delivery on our platform because there's going to be a proof from the beginning that you actually did on the blockchain. But if indeed you did not, there's also going to be a proof that you did not because that package obviously would not display that um, it's on the blockchain. Then um, beyond just um, um, package placement or package request placement, we also make sure that payment itself is also done on the blockchain. So um, for payment, what that means is as a user, when you pay for a particular package delivery, we hold it in trust because it's an escrow system, it's a peer-to-peer -peer solution actually. So the platform holds that payment in trust, waiting for the rider to make that delivery. So the moment the user makes payment for that package is also indicated on the blockchain through our stable um, asset called KPL, which is used to track that particular payment. And then when the rider fulfills the delivery and the user confirms that they have received the package that they have requested for, the funds is then released and transferred to that rider. And then, yeah, that's uh, another way we are leveraging Hedera because we use the Hedera um, token solution to create the KPL token. Then uh, another aspect is, of course, the uh, financial record aspect where we actually do a proper bookkeeping of cash flows in terms of inflow and outflow, uh, in terms of um, deposits by users and withdrawal by riders. And of course, whatever the account balance will be for each party per time. Yeah. And of so course, obviously. we have, sorry, and of course, we have this um, proof of transactions on chain. All, all the hash IDs are available, and of course, they can be tracked. Yes. Adding trust to the process. So, what does the roadmap look like in terms of timeframes? When can we expect, you know, your different milestones to be reached in, in the months and year to come? Okay. So, um, um, right now, we are in the phase of moving the product from v1 to v2 so we are building quick pick 2.0 so the goal of quick pick 2.0 is to move beyond just logistics of delivering of anything to providing specific delivery needs like people who wants to buy food people who wants to buy groceries so instead of going to the grocery store or to the food store to buy these things physically and have them um, you know take back to your home you can just leverage quick pick for that and why we feel that this particular use case is important for us right now is because over here in africa the price of fuel you know gas generally is changing from what we used to know it government used to subsidize gas and fuel for citizens but these days because of you know obvious um, global economic changes and 
specifically changes in each country, they're removing those subsidies. So fuel is becoming very expensive. So now is the best time for people to leverage e-commerce marketplace and you know delivery marketplace to place deliveries and get those deliveries delivered. So to achieve that in, in before the end of Q1, QuickPick 2.0 is going to go live. People will be able to order for fresh farm produce. They will be able to order for groceries and also order for food and, of course, delivery of anything. Then in addition to that, we are also planning on expanding into African countries. We've just recently touched ground in Ghana. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, things are picking up slowly for the Ghana market. So we plan to go into other African countries, at least before the end of Q2, we want to be in at least five African countries. And being in five African countries means more customers for us, more money in terms of revenue, which also increases the on-chain transaction for Hedera in general. Then one last thing I would like to talk about is to further um, you know, solidify the proof of the carbon emissions that we are generating as a company. So that's another aspect I forgot to talk about. So we're actually leveraging Hedera to display the amount of carbons that we are emitting every time a dispatch request is completed. Now, it, we are doing this because over time, we want to be able to prove to the impact funds or, or the impact guys who like the UN and the, the people who are involved with trying to make our environment cleaner, that logistics indeed, especially for Africa, needs clean vehicles because the carbons we're emitting is enormous. So with clean vehicles, we're able to reduce carbon emission and make the environment clean for everyone. Yes. It, it fits exactly with what the Hedera Sustainable Impact Fund or the HBAR Foundation Sustainable Impact Fund is doing. So awesome. it's great to hear. So we know we have some HBAR variants over there in Africa. For those that might want to get involved, how will they be able to get involved with QuickBix? Okay. Um, so for those, you mean for the, the sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch that question. So the people that are local in your area that, that want to try to get involved, how would they do that? Is there going to be an application that they need to get on their phone or so oh, forth? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course. So um, we have two types of application. We have the rider application and then the user application. So if you want to, for instance, order for a package or have a package picked up and delivered to you, all you have to do is download the user app, which is on Play Store and also on App Store, right? And um, for the riders who wants to be a part of us, join our ever-growing um, rider community, all they have to do is either download the app from the rider app from Play Store or also App Store, complete the KYC verification process. And then once that is done, we just begin to give them deliveries on the go. And the beautiful thing about our, our rider program is that unlike so many other, you know, um, platforms similar to ours, we take a very low fee, very, very low fee. We are over 70% cheaper to the other platform. So the riders who are on our platform literally take almost 100% of what they end. We just take a fraction of that. Yes. Those kind of efficiencies are exactly what we want to hear. Obviously, thank you so much for swinging by and explaining QuickFix. Thank you, Brandon. Really nice talking to you today. Yeah, so great to hear from Abasi there. I really think that he's firing on three cylinders there, you know, financial inclusion, deep in, and then also the sustainability side, you know, three major Web3 narratives. And of course, coming out of Davos, we know that sustainability is and has been a massive focus. And this year we had it combined with the intersection of AI through Equity Lab, and so Equity Lab, also in partnership with Hugging Face, an open AI kind of platform, they use the Hedera Consensus Service for the data integrity of the AI large language model that they've been using, which I think is tracking over, well, over 100 billion different climate tokens. Um, and so they, out of Davos, they, they had a, uh, you know, a side sort of media opportunity with a, public, uh, a publication called The Banker, who are a subsidiary of the Financial Times, which is one of the biggest financial newspapers in the world, if not the biggest. So they came out with a, a publication about the intersection of AI, sustainability and blockchain. And Hedera had a great feature there for a very, very high quality audience. So hopefully Hedera is on a lot more people's radars through that.
Hey, Zip, the more coverage we can get, the better. And especially in that refi space, which I, I think is going to absolutely explode in the years to come. Now, Rob Allen and Shark Bites usually cover some refi stuff. It's one of his main passions. We didn't get any questions on refi this week, but he had some great insights. He, we got some great questions from the community. So check it out. Rob, welcome back. How's your week going? Hey, Brandon. Oh, it's great. I mean, we've got so many things going on. I've loved the buzz in the community this week. We've had NFT launches. We've had HTS craziness. So, I mean, I'm I just, uh, just loving the, uh, the retail vibe at the moment. You just wait. I know the market is actually down while we're recording this, but I couldn't be more excited. I'm, I'm talking to a few of the teams in the space, and we have some really exciting things coming going forward. But yeah. we'll, we'll kick it off with some of the questions we got here. To start, we had a really good one from John. He asks, what's likely to happen if Layer 1s fail to generate enough transactions and therefore revenue to sustain? Will they simply close up shop, or do you see mergers and acquisitions? Now, I've never heard about... <laughs> <laughs> mergers and acquisitions when it comes to these DLT networks. But he goes on to say, are we several years out from this? So what are your thoughts, Rob? Yeah, it's, yeah, I've, mergers and acquisitions are a, a strange thing to, to think about in terms of kind of layer one public networks. But I guess the context is, and the context of the question is, can a, can a chain become a ghost chain? Can it become uh, not used? Um, and then what? What happens after that? And, and how would that happen? Well, I mean, we've seen it happen. We've seen chains just fall out of use. Most of the early chains in the, uh, the blockchain space didn't have true utility. And so they, it was really all about speculation on their cryptocurrency. And some of them were successful and, and some, some not so much. Now, the mechanisms for that happening would be, you know, that cryptocurrency no longer gets transacted. The value falls, maybe falls to zero. And then what happens? Well, in a you know, in a proof of work world, you know the original Bitcoin consensus, you have no purpose in running a node. You know you have no purpose in burning the energy in order to secure the network and achieve consensus, and therefore because you're not getting a return. But as we know, most blockchains and DLTs this day are not proof of work. And so what does a proof of stake kind of or, or similar uh, consensus mechanism world look like? Well, you're still staking the, the, the coin in order to secure the network. But if the coin is, is worthless because it's gone to zero, then why would you hold it? You know, so th this is how you know, chains become ghost chains and, and not used. The, the technology is still there. If you wanted to run a node, then you could still run a node. But why do it? And this is why some of these chains become kind of hobby chains, because the open source node technology is still available and you can still run a blockchain. It's just it has very little purpose. Um, the less value that those coins hold, the easier it is to accumulate more and therefore you know, um, uh, compromise the network. So ultimately, that's how chains die. Um, they would not, I would think, be merged. But what we have seen is some chains, you know, with their own token, choose to incorporate an alternate technology. So an example of that might be Helium, you know, which chose to move from its own blockchain, its own um, token technology to, to Solana, yeah, a, a choice that we kind of talked about a couple of years ago and um, decided was a pretty bad one and was driven by certain bag holders that were very Solana you know, supporting. But that's a good example, really, of how a dying chain can then be incorporated into another one. So maybe that's a good example of a merger. We, on the Hedera side, could potentially you know, be a chain like that, a distributed ledger onto which um, the utility of other chains could be you know, absorbed or uh, provide, let's say, a, a, a layer two or an app net layer or, or um, a side chain. So you could incorporate those uh, utility, you know, very specific uh, special purpose chains into um, and pegged to um, Hedera with an HVAR economy underneath it. Now, so we actually have seen that, right? With MasterCard provenance, they're, they're sunsetting, and that's been shifted over to Hedera in some forms. Yeah, that's, that would be another example of, of, because, of course, provenance was a private permission chain, so more of a distributed solution than a, than a kind of true blockchain. 
But it's a great, it's a great example of how one would take a, a, a decentralized or distributed solution and secure it against a public network. So in this case, Fresh Supply Company, you know, did the, um, use the Hedera consensus service and now using the token service to actually replace some of the private permissioned utility on that uh, provenance chain. So yes, that would be another great example. But of course, there was no crypto associated with provenance. There was no kind of native token of that network because it didn't need it. Public networks do need them. And so you've got the whole economy around the transition of a dying chain onto, you know, onto a, a new uh, onto a new chain. So there's the transfer of, of value from one chain to another. And in order to do that, you've got a lot of competing interests. You've obviously you've got lots of bag holders. You've got an economy that needs to transfer. Imagine transferring an economy from a from a small country into a large com- country. I mean, we've seen that obviously you know, in, in the um, U.S. dollar becoming the reserve currency of the, the world. You know, many small countries cannot afford to run their own currency with all the institutions that are necessary to do that, and they're not big enough to have that scale. And therefore, they peg to the U.S. dollar in order that they can run a, a, a kind of proxy economy. It's the same thing with a d- decentralized economy, which is you know what effectively blockchains are. And so, you know, I do imagine and can envisage certain chains that are don't have sufficient critical mass and therefore security or community kind of piggybacking onto a larger, more scalable, more secure um, public ledger. So, you know, for all those reasons, I can I can um, envisage that happening. And we do have examples of um, that where that could happen, um, both with Hedera and other chains. And I, I, you know, um, there are a lot of chains, a lot of uh, earlier chains that were very special purpose, you know, supply chain specific or IoT specific chains, which actually Hedera, if it had been around at that time or it had been an option, uh, could and should have been adopted. And as those chains, you know, wither or, or become more and more bespoke or less and less used, then those communities um, could could and should consider Hedera as a, a way of, as a destination for, for transfer. Just the mechanism for transfer can be quite tricky sometimes. Well, great points and well covered. So the next one comes from your initiative with your HCS20 token, the, the Sharky <laughs> token. And yeah. it comes from Jack Timothy, who asks, what's your take on Hedera's marketing strategy? How would you take it to the next level? So thank you, Jack. Um, Jack from Kabila. And we're, um, we're, I'm going to be talking to him later. We picked this question because it's the only one that's uh, on the HCS20 leaderboard. So we've learned we some great We will prioritize these. We will. The we will prioritize. If they come in this route, then whatever whatever I'm asked, I'm going to answer. And this is quite a tricky one, right? Because um, I'm the last person on the planet to, uh, to be asking uh, marketing or creative advice of, it, of any description. And of course, you know, there are kind of governing council aspects. So I'm speaking purely as, as Rob and not, you know, a representative of governing council. I'm not a marketing strategist. Charles actually has an awesome background in marketing. So I'm going to take a few notes. I'm going to be listening very carefully to what Charles Atkins comes out and, um, and does over the, the next few months. I've got to remember Hedera and the Hedera LLC is, uh, you know, represents the network operator. The network operator cannot be shilling the coin or, you know, pushing the uh, HBAR price in any way. It's got to be very focused on the network, securing the network and, you know, the reasons for the existence of Hedera. The foundations, however, are specifically set up to business develop and commercialize and um, uh, and grow the network and grow the network economy, which absolutely fits into the growth potential of and the utility of the network. And in my view, that is where we should be really pushing the you know, the marketing around retail, uh, retail adoption, and how the wider community can use and can build on on Hedera. And we're we're specifically seeing that. In fact, in the last week or so, we've, we've seen Shane and Elaine and, uh, and some of the other foundation members do some, some very interesting, make some very interesting comments that are, you know, um, extreme retail, I would say, around meme coins and, and you know, everything else. 
at the at the um, Hedera end, we've got the marketing committee, right? So the marketing committee sets the strategy on behalf of the governing council. So we've got we've kind of got two different um, areas for marketing. And I think strategically we must remember that. So we've got the commercialization and business development side, and we've got Hedera marketing, which is going to be top end of town and ensuring that the um, the enterprise aspects of um, of Hedera are always front and center with um, you know, the peers of the governing council and the governing council members themselves. So strategically, I think there should be a separation. That's perfectly okay. I mean, that's that's actually you know pure decentralization anyway. We have a marketing team that we, we know and love around Christian and uh, Christian Hasker and the Swords Labs team. So I think strategically where we need to be uh, looking again, purely just just as um, a Sharky Rob, is um, finding a way that we can do both, you know, win both uh, both aspects of, of marketing. We've got to be able to market Hedera to enterprise without falling foul of, you know, very, very unclear SEC um, guidelines on such things and separation of, you know, network operation from um, commercialization. And we need to empower and, and embrace and um, celebrate the retail end, you know, the community and, and all the amazing things that we are now seeing as, as we uh, opened with in the community and retail space. So that's a, that's a difficult balance to strike, you know, with a single team. But I'm sure Charles and Christian will, are going to be having some very, very interesting conversations in the next month or so. Rob, I'll say that I'm revitalized with some of the conversations that I'm having. And it's not with Hedera. It's not with Swirls Labs. It's not even with the foundations that you talked about. It's with some of the builders in the space. And I think that's where a lot of the next excitement is going to come from. Can't share what we're talking about quite yet, but I think okay. the community is going to be really excited by it. All right. So next up, we have Hashgraph Token, who asks, where are the October, November, and December meeting minutes? August and September were released in October. The last meeting minutes are five months old, released four months ago. Now, I think your response is probably going to be a little bit more positive than the, the questioner might think. But Rob, what are your thoughts on why these meeting minutes have not been published as of yet? I'm not sure if this is a, an older question, actually, because the October min minutes have been published. I checked earlier. So yes, August, August September, and October are out. November were the in-person meeting in Singapore. So that's that's three days worth of minutes, right? That's that's a, a significant undertaking. And the process of releasing these minutes is that the minutes are produced, they're shared for uh, consideration, then they are um, submitted to a subsequent governing council meeting for approval. Once approved, they're, they're released within within a, a couple of weeks. So, you know, there is a, a kind of stepwise process. So November is a, we had a governing council member in no, November. So this three day event in um, in Singapore and then December as well. There was no governing council meeting in January. Um, there was a you know, kind of a leadership meeting of all the co-chairs and the board and key members. But there was no governing council meeting. So February, in fact, next week, the governing council, in fact, two weeks time, will approve or be asked to approve both November and December. And then I expect we'll get those two out within, you know, by the end of February. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate that there are some Hedera watchers that uh, expect every governing council to have a, 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 a release of the previous uh, minutes almost immediately. I think Christmas has just got in the way here and the fact that we had this big um, um, event governing council, which has taken a, a bit longer to, to have approved. Um, it wasn't approved in December and therefore or it wasn't ready to be approved in December. And then before we, we skipped the month in January, but they're all they're all circulating at the moment for comment. And then we'll get uh, get approved in the next uh, week or two. Rob, I may be the perpetual optimist, but I always think it's because or when it's delayed like this, it's because there's some kind of news, a council member or something that can't be shared quite yet, but will be coming <laughs> out in the future. That's that's always what I think. Maybe not in this case, but well, we that, have well, those another things one. are redacted, right? I mean, they're, yeah. they're, okay. we, we do we do we do we don't wait on releasing uh, minutes. There is a process. Um, like I said, we, we just didn't get through the approval process for the long minutes in December. 
but we wouldn't be held up by by the um, the announcement of a governing council member. That would just not be included in, in that particular minute. It's quite interesting seeing back who attends the um, the uh, the meetings because governing potential governing council members, you know, it's in their kind of press time frame. It's up to the governing council, the, the the new governing council member, on the timing for the release of that announcement. So sometimes they attend uh, governing council meetings prior to formally joining as as observers or as you know to to um, uh, to contribute in a you know. Uh, uh, what we're going to do kind of way and they get redacted from uh, from that release and then maybe inserted later so anyway that's that's it's just the mechanisms of governance and uh, yes I, I, on behalf of the governing council I, I apologize for it taking a little longer than normal this time no, that's fair. That's no problem. All right. So Barca LT says, will Hedera be able to remain competitive despite Ethereum's EIP 4844 upgrade, which aims to dramatically reduce transaction fees on layer two networks? Will Hedera be able to maintain its advantages over other L2 and L1 networks with its technology and advantages? Mark and Barsukas had similar questions around EIP 4844. So what are your thoughts on Ethereum's continued development and upgrades and Hedera's adoption in the face of that? Yeah, it's not a threat, right? I mean, all of the, all of the successful networks are developing, right? They've all got core engineering. They are all kind of moving forward. They've all got improvement proposal processes. So, you know, one would, we were talking about ghost chains earlier. The, the, the chains that don't have the core engineering, don't have the, the active developer communities, they're the ones that you know, die pretty quickly. So, you know, it's healthy to the wider Web3 system, you know, ecosystem that um, the, the chains that have, you know, the large amounts of liquidity are contributing and continuing to develop. But they're still blockchains. It's still a trilemma, right? They're still constrained architecturally. And the whole purpose of, um, so we were talking about uh, the question about EIP 4844. Um, there's a wider context for, um, for, for this uh, proposal, which is about what they refer to as dank sharding. And dank sharding is, you know, a sharding mechanism to enable Ethereum to scale. Scaling is, as we know, one of the, the constraints on, on the trilemma. And it's still a constraint, right? You, you scale Ethereum, your basically your EIP 4844 is called proto dank sharding and it's, it's the prototype version it's the preliminary steps to get to this dank sharding future and this is about reducing fees on the uh, ethereum mainnet for layer twos uh, and users of layer twos because there are still you know um, that link that um, underlying securing of a layer two against a layer one and the layer one is still incurring costs on the layer two. So, you know, it, it, it's a really, these, the trilemma constraint compromises introduce more and more uh, complexity. And part of the way that they're doing this is creating data blobs, which are kind of sidecars to the layer one transactional calls from the layer two, which is additional complexity. So, I mean, the, the, the compromises are still there and proto dank sharding and dank sharding and, and data blob side sidecars. They're all kind of uh, trying to get around the trilemma problem, which we don't have. Hedera doesn't have that. You know, we uh, Lehman Baird's um, genius design has meant that we don't have to put all this effort and energy and, you know, community engagement and discussion and, you know, long roadmap changes in order to to get to the point where we that we are already at. And it's a good thing, right? Because every time we talk about or, or some community talks about, you know, proto dank sharding and the need to um, address the, the uh, trilemma, it gives us the opportunity to say, well, yeah, we don't have that because, and then you get into that conversation of why not. Yeah, so we have a lot of those conversations. We 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 absolutely do. And I I asked one of one of uh, our friendly developer advocates over at Swirls and and Lehman uh, um, exactly this question. You know, can just you know how do we feel about this? And and Lehman said it's true that Hedera's extreme speed means that uh, there won't be a need to build a layer two on top of Hedera mainnet or layer one for speed reasons. And when our usage grows to the point that it is reaching the limit of what a single shard can handle, then we will go to multiple shards. 
And that sharding means that we have multiple networks communicating with each other. But instead of a subordinate network, a layer two, communicating with a primary level, network, a layer one, it becomes many peer networks or shards that communicate with each other as equals. So this is, you know, this is Lee, from Lehman's uh, own mouth that we have already thought about what a shard looks like. We know when we're going to have to, you know, start incorporating additional shards, and it's all by design. This isn't a rear guard action like a proto dank sharding kind of EIP proposal. It's all part of the the, the plan. So, long answer, short short. Uh, the short version of which is, no, we've, we're absolutely not worried about um, uh, Ethereum and proto-dank sharding at all. Sounds good. All right. So Eric has a question around Zenny. He said, Zenny's goal of adding 50 to 70 million unique users to the Hedera network sounds very big. If they succeed, will their project become a cornerstone for HBAR? And will this possibly lead to an accelerated positive price development for HBAR, regardless of what the market as a whole does? Now, we can't talk about price, but I just want to read the question off verbatim. He goes on to say, I feel like Hedera needs something that will really make waves. Could this even lead to a possible reevaluation of the staking rewards? Am I overestimating this project or are there really great opportunities here on various fronts for the Hedera ecosystem. So, Rob, what are your thoughts here on Zenny? Um, I love Zenny. I think Zenny is um, one of the hidden gems. Actually, not not that hidden anymore. But you know, Xbox is a token which you know regularly makes the uh, the, the leaderboard. And for those of you who don't know about Zenny, um, it's a kind of a personal travel service, but far more than that. And I really do think that they're going to be making waves. It's a, it's a brilliant use case. It's being executed by a very committed, very engaging and very bright uh, a t founding team. So do some research and uh, I'm going to check them out because this is one of those use cases which probably could only be built on Hedera and of which there are many. Right. And this is where unicorns are made. You know, a brilliant use case, fantastic technology, great team. I wouldn't bet against them, right? And it's it's a it's a wonderful niche as well. All of those. I mean, I've not seen the uh, the, the forecast for for the numbers, but you know, 50 to 70 million uh, new accounts. You know, why not? I mean, if this is if this is the next Airbnb or the next Hotels.com or or you know the next big you know reward system. Absolutely, it would have that many um, account users. How would that translate into TPS, which then translates into revenue? Don't know. But, you know, one can speculate that, you know, everyone who wants to, you know, let's say every business user and every personal user uses this service to help them arrange all of their, their, their travel. That's lots of interactions, right? So it's, it's not only the account creation, it's every every interaction, it's every kind of, uh, consumer or customer engagement point, and it's every kind of reward point and you know redemption or um, burn of those tokens. So that's a lot of interactions, and um, then you start cross pollinating that into other parts of the ecosystem, which, being an open you know public ledger, um, one could imagine happening. It, it's it's it could be a cornerstone. You know, it really could be a cornerstone of the. Um, um, of the Hedera ecosystem, but then so could many others. You know, we there are many um, great businesses like this that we're now seeing emerge in in the Hedera ecosystem, and there will be partnerships between them, and the network effect will kind of grow and grow and grow. So absolutely, you know, um, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't not bet on them. They're a great team. I will say after talking to Sachin, it seemed more like an expectation that 50 to 70 million additional accounts. Now, we only have 4 million accounts on the Hedera network now. It seemed more like an expectation than a goal because they have some big things in the works. And mm -hmm. as soon as that comes out, we'll make sure to get Sachin back so he can talk about it uh, more. But I'm really excited about it. I, I think they have so much potential and we've already seen some of their impacts. But when we're talking about 50 to 70 million new accounts, we're talking about millions of dollars of revenue just from that alone. So I'm really excited about it. Rob, that's all we have time for today. I want to remind everybody that if you want to make sure your questions make a priority here on Shark Bites, use that initiative, the Sharky token and the HCX instructions you see up on your screen right now to participate. Rob, thank you so much. We love your insights every 
every week. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, everybody, for asking your questions. My pleasure, Brandon. And see everyone next week. So great to hear the insights of Rob, as always. You know, I think we're very lucky to have a leading figure on the council who is also that in touch with the community. And on the community front, there are, is currently a Hedera Guardian hackathon going on as part of the DLT Earth Initiative with over $100,000 different prizes for projects around the refi economy, around carbon accounting, and methodologies on the Hedera Guardian. I've heard some very, very exciting names have, have been a part of that, which I'm sure we'll find out a lot more about. But if you are a refi sustainability focused, um, you know, developer, now is your chance. It's still ongoing, it finishes on April the 8th. So there's a lot of time left and, you know, there's a lot of opportunity there to be shoulder to shoulder with some massive projects and also to carve out your own piece of the sustainability space on Hedera. So get involved if you are interested. Absolutely. Now, our builders are really making huge strides. And one of the teams that does some of the best work in getting builders to together, getting collaboration, is the HBAR Foundry. And not only that, they're creating some great content. They had both Charles, the new president from Hedera, and they had Simon Olson. He is the representative on the council from Magalu, from Magazine Louisa. I hadn't heard him from from him since day one. And they've been one of the oldest governing council members and his insights were invaluable. You can tell that he is so engaged in Hedera. It was great to see. I caught some highlights from that, but you have to go watch the whole thing because this is just a small chunk of it, but check it out. First, the usual disclaimers. I am indeed an HBAR holder. These represent my opinions, not the opinions of Magazine Louise or Magalu, the company I, I uh, represent. And also, this is not investment advice. Okay, so that out, out of the way. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about my, my background. So I'm from New York originally, but I've lived in Brazil for uh, 20 years or so. And uh, I was a partner at one of the first venture capital firms in Brazil. 2005, I sold our portfolio company, Aquan, to Google, which was one of Google's first dozen acquisitions ever. 2007, I partnered our venture capital firm with Draper Fisher Jurvetson, which is Tim Draper's venture capital firm. After that, 2010, I joined Google Brazil as the uh, head of new business development for Brazil. And then since then, I've been at Magazine Luiza or Magalu as it's known. And there I'm the director of new business development and investor relations. And I just recently left, but I'm now uh, the full-time representative for Magalu on the uh, Hadera uh, Council. So that's a little bit about my background. Um, if you want me to go into how I first heard about uh, Hadera, it's actually a funny story. So I like to cook and I'm from New York originally, as I mentioned, so I like to uh, make Italian food. And so one weekend in February, 2018, uh, I was making uh, meatballs and spaghetti. And uh, I had my hands, you know, deep in some ground beef making the meatballs. And the YouTube video that I was watching uh, switched uh, from the previous video that I was watching ended. And this guy came on giving a presentation and talking about a new uh, consensus algorithm that he had invented, which used very little energy and didn't have much latency and was highly scalable. And it was music to my ears because I always was super fascinated by Bitcoin and blockchain, but I was always very frustrated by the energy use and the latency. And so when I heard this guy talking about a new consensus algorithm that overcame those issues, I was extremely uh, interested. So that's how I kind of first heard about Hedera. And then uh, basically, so that was on, let's say, a Saturday or a Sunday, that Monday, I sent an email to whatever it was, like info at hashgraph.com or something like that. I said, hey, I, my name is Simon, head of new business development at you know, one of the leading tech companies in Latin America. Let's look for something to do together. And uh, so the rest is history. So now it's, I think officially this week, it'll be, uh, actually next week, it'll be officially uh, six years. So long time. It's funny, um, I was reflecting on this uh, uh, last night and uh, people forget 
So at the time, there was a, a sea of layer one platforms and they all had competing claims and it was very difficult to differentiate who really had what they said they had and who didn't. So we really had to take a, you know, sort of an, a leap of faith. Initially, uh, when we signed the governing council agreement, I think we were the second or third company to do so. So you, at certain point, you know, again, you just have to take that leap of faith. You know, things have changed, you know, infinitely. Um, so there was, the network wasn't even public at first, right? So we were there for open access. So, but until that, you don't really know. Well, it's supposed to scale. Is it really going to be able to scale? So now, you know, we've got over, I think, uh, a thousand transactions per second running on the network. Now we've got over 30 billion transactions processed over the history of Federa. So, but in those days, we didn't know any of that. So we, we had to, you know, cross our fingers. But again, you know, doing your due diligence and looking at the people involved and uh, digging into the technology is kind of what gives you the comfort. But there's been a lot of things also, you know. So for example, we knew how the governing council was supposed to work but you can have these frameworks and whether people behave the way they're supposed to in real life is another issue. And thankfully, on that point, again, we've also really nailed it in the sense that I think the quality of the council members, the quality of the individuals, the level of their engagement and everything has really surpassed everyone's expectations. And so, um, yeah, things are really sort of night and day from where they were in the early days. And again, you know, we didn't know whether we'd be able to attract highest quality uh, governing council members. So, you know, as a, just as an example, from technology companies, we've got Google, we've got IBM, we've got Dell, we've got ServiceNow. From banking, we've got uh, Standard Bank, which is the largest bank in South Africa. We've got Shinhan Bank, which is the largest bank in South Korea. We've got DBS, which is the largest bank in Singapore. And so, but again, at the in the early days, we really didn't know, this looks great on paper, will it actually work? And much to our glee, uh, it actually has worked and yeah, it's going really well. I'm gonna kind of continue with this theme of the evolution. It's really a question for both of you guys and feel free to uh, provide commentary with your different backgrounds. So. One of the things that we have all heard in the community, Mans, I think as recently as last month, uh, you know, spoke about this, is that the, the barriers to entry for governing council members are higher than ever. Uh, yes, you know, there is this 39 governing council cap or like the, the 39 step book type of thing, but, but we don't have to be there. And I think we have all seen to all intents and purposes that the 29, not 30 with Hitachi, Certainly when it comes to, to dis decentralized decision, decision making, the governing council, you know, protecting them against forking, all those things seem to be working. So where I'm going with this is tell us a little bit about kind of how you how do you evaluate prospective governing council members? Uh, how do you look at their use cases? Are, are there ways in which you evaluate the, the merits of the use cases? I think we're all, and this is a question that was repeated by a number of people in the community. So I think there's a lot of interest in this area. Great. So I guess I, I can get started. I'm the co-chair, by the way, of a uh, membership committee. So Bill Miller and I are uh, are actually responsible for, for leading a lot of these efforts. And I'll tell you, it, it reminds me of my days as a venture capitalist because you start out and you, every company looks really good. And then uh, over time, you you develop you discern more you're you're better at judging things and you actually wind up getting higher quality companies and you're able to sort of raise the bar and that's essentially what's happened the other interesting thing is there's tons of pitfalls believe it or not so sometimes it's a great company fortune 500 company great and then you look underneath the surface who's leading the effort oh it's just the sales guy and he's just doing it because he wants to reach the companies that are on the council with his own solution or something like that, right? Or sometimes you get a company that's doing it and it's someone from, let's say, marketing who's doing it for marketing reasons, or you do it, someone's under pressure from their board of directors to show that they're, you know, into new technologies. So, uh, so over time, you kind of learn to, uh, you learn what the pitfalls are and 
That said, though, the, the quality of the companies that are approaching us to investigate joining the council uh, has never been higher. You know, we're absolutely thrilled. And uh, we think that as time passes and this market gets a little bit more mature, uh, we think that we're going to continue to get, get a, a strong uh, flow of, of new uh, candidates. And I'll tell you another thing which is interesting was with all the FTX scandal and everything, if you were at a Fortune 500 company and you were bringing up uh, doing something with distributed ledger technology over the last 18 months, it was a really hard sell. But my sense is that this nuclear winter, so to speak, is thawing. And I think that we're going to uh, continue to see very high quality uh, people from some of the most you know, iconic uh, companies in the world applying for uh, membership. So super happy about that. The other thing I will touch on that's really interesting is there are a lot of people that see the logos in the major companies and they think, you know, that's not a very, you know, quote unquote, crypto centric company. But I think if you look a little bit deeper and you actually discuss the topic of this industry with the individual representing that company, you'll find something very different. They are the representatives from these companies are extremely knowledgeable in the area, and they are essentially the educators for their entire organization. So, when they come to these council meetings, they come to the committees, which are held all the time. <clears throat> they retain information, they gain information, they take that that back to their companies, and they're really the Hedera advocates within their organization. So that's something that you know I haven't. I, I was reading an article this morning where there was. Um, a particular chain being mentioned and they were they were bragging extensively about how they had a now a, a 13 person voting committee and it kind of made me laugh that it's like Hedera, Hedera has 30 now and we're and we're working on going to 39 and you know th these people had an entire key article written because they had just now gotten 13 people and it's like that's how we've always done business so this is kind of what we're doing at the foundry. I don't know if it was by design or what, but we come together every Friday um, in an informal setting and we share best practices across the table. We share the struggles that we're having from one project to the next. And a lot of our projects are now being involved with one another, leveraging the development from one platform to perform something that I need. Why should I develop it again? So is, are, is there any kind of collaboration like that on specific projects between governing council members? Absolutely. And you, you raise a great point, which is that we're really big into open source. And um, we actually, Hadera brought on a executive who's specifically responsible for that. And I can tell you, and again, this is where internal, uh, it's a shame that you guys can't be sort of a fly on the wall for some of this. There is a lot of, of pressure that, hey, if you're going to be building something, try to build it in a way that's open source so that the different modules can be re reused by other council members or other developers in the community so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. And so they can, you know, take part of the open source code and reuse it in their own project, which will help accelerate it. So, yeah, that's a big part of what we're trying to do. And that is, a, uh, I can remember multiple discussions where that's been uh, emphasized. So, yeah, definitely. Andrew Aiken is actually the uh, executive who is brought on to uh, do that. And he's, you know, super engaged and really uh, vocal uh, about it. And so I think you can expect good things from us in that direction. I always tell people, you know, working at Hedera is like working with electricity. Like it's very difficult to say who couldn't use it. Um, it's just how many of those people can we actually get to in a short amount of time. Um, there's there's almost practically a use case for most people in most industries on the globe. One of the things that's easiest is when we either have a governing council member or just another company. There, there are a lot of companies that use the technology that are not part of the council or not part of the council yet. When you already have a case study in your hand and you can go to somebody and say, hey, this is no longer theoretical. This this is happening. This is the case study. In fact, let me introduce you to the member who built it. <laughs> um, that level of trust and power when it comes into speaking to other companies is you can't beat that. All right. So in those clips, we saw Jim Nasser of Acor, one of the 
original H Barbarians. And his company just brought another team member on, and that's Milan, the Hedera dev. Milan is, again, a great H Barbarian. He is a great builder, does almost everything with no code, but he's going to be leading the Acor Labs division, and they're going to be pushing innovation within the Hedera ecosystem. So congratulations to Milan. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, you know, I can't think of many people that deserve it more than Milan. And of course, that intersection of healthcare and the Hedera consensus service in particular, but all Hedera services is potentially huge. You know, even Duncan Moore, you know, the representative for Aberdeen has said multiple times that he thinks that alongside, you know, that financial instrument tokenization, one of the most untapped parts of Web3 currently is within healthcare. And, you know, having someone like Milan, who is, you know, so dedicated to Hedera, so innovative on Hedera, I think, you know, what, what better person to have on board? So excited to see where Hedera and Jim and the, the whole team at Acor go. Absolutely. And now we're going to come full circle. We're going to get back into the HBAR economy with an influencer from South Korea that was highlighting Saucer Swab. What did you see come out of that? I've heard that South Korea loves Hedera, and that is no small part thanks to Alice Kim, who's on the BD developed team at the foundation, who was at Hedera before then, and who has been you know, a big part of the business team throughout the Hedera ecosystem for a long time. You know, she brought on Shinhan, she brought on the bank that Shinhan worked with, she led the most recent stablecoin international remittance proof of concept, and the one before that. So she's a a real, real committed H barbarian in that sense. And so she is, you know, really pushing out Hedera as much as possible in South Korea. South Korea is, you know, an emerging Web3 gaming economy, definitely, but they are very, very far ahead in the adoption of digital assets. You know, the regulation is getting more friendly at the moment, but just in terms of, you know, consumer adoption, retail adoption, massive, massive place for it. So for us to have, you know, who is a, a pretty large influencer in South Korea, now talking about SourceSwap, to see that SourceSwap have their own, you know, Korean language speaking page as well, I really hope that, you know, that is an economy that we can tap into and that we grow our own sort of fan base out there. And sticking with Hedera DeFi, one of our most popular HTS tokens, of course, is Karate. They had a really popular event this past week. It was Kickback 1. It was a little bit different from what we normally see, but they still had a lot of interaction. And we have another even bigger event with KC44 coming up in a few weeks. But what I was really impressed with was the usage metrics that came out around their Hedera-based app for this Kickback number 1. And I caught up with only LARPing. He's one of their founders to give us some more information. Though we love to have you on, I wasn't planning on having you back so soon until I saw the user data results from kickback number one. Can you tell us what you're seeing as far as karate combat up only gaming participation? Yeah, I mean, I think across the board, we're really pleased with the metrics from the last few events. I think, you know, the really easy number is the amount of karate played. That's people actually own that karate and they're playing it. And that was up like 66%, which is a lot in a month. Probably means people are going out and buying karate to play with it, or at a minimum, you know, not selling and re-engaging. You know, I know there's also in a time period where like the price was up like 150% or something. So I think like the actual dollar amount of karate played probably went from like, I don't know, like two or 3 million to 7 million or something, which was just a big jump. Uh, so the prize pool ended up being like, half a million bucks this time of karate, which is pretty cool. And then, you know, the other number that's that's pretty easy is the retention analysis. That's been really stable. We're seeing like basically no churn uh, after a cohort's second event. So like from third event on, you're really not losing any players, which is pretty outstanding for a mobile app. And I think it shows very strong evidence that people are enjoying it and that it's easy enough to use. And so we're super excited about that. The headline number, the user growth numbers was pretty kind of shocking, I'd say. You know, we, we expected continued growth, but I don't think we expected to grow at like 100 and whatever it was, 60% or something. Um, we, we have been working really hard on marketing the app. So we had like five or six different campaigns ahead of the event. But yeah, if you're, if you're not really losing players, right, which we're not after second event, a cohort plays, then it, it just comes down to how many players you add. And we added a ton of players as I noted in my notes there, there was like definitely some anecdotal evidence of some multi-accounting in some of the quests that we ran. So I wouldn't be 
shocked if like this cohort retains a bit worse than others. But we're going to keep at it. We got a bunch of growth initiatives coming, you know, over the next, you know, one to five months, mostly pro- product led. So. Yeah. Good stuff. So there was some controversy around the bouts that resulted in no contests with no winner. Sure. Yeah. So with no winner in those fights, the karate token wasn't distributed. And we can understand kind of the frustration of people that put a fair amount of karate on those fighters. What do you think the resolution for this will be going forward? Uh, it's a good question. I think it'll be down to the token holders. We'll have to put it to a vote. You know, there was a lot of discussion in the governance forum this weekend about it. Most of us were traveling back to town like yesterday, traveling back home. So I would expect, you know, to put this to a governance vote uh, later this week. Personally, I I understand the frustration. I mean, one of the most common things that people complain about in sports is the judging or the referees or whatever. Right. And so this is that's really, I think, what people are complaining at. They're like, my guy was going to win and he didn't. And so that's understandable and expected and is never going to go away. From an up on the gaming perspective, I'm not sure I quite see like the logic of distributing the tokens in a no contest because it literally means like the fight didn't happen. But if that's what the token if that's what the token holders want, that's what the token holders want. So we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to put it to a, a vote. I don't feel super strongly about it, so I'm not going to like kind of like oppose it. I think it'd be really weird unusual and unlikely that we go back and like try and fix quote unquote the last event just because we have so much stuff going on and we've got another event coming up in like three and a half weeks so sure that's understandable now to be honest going back to some of the points you made before considering the big names the location and the hype around karate combat 43 that was your event back in december i was half expecting the up only gaming participation to go down for kickback number one which really was more of a contender event than one of your main events what do you think the, the user data essentially going parabolic means for karate combat 44 your event next month and the rest of the year yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say. I think your guess is as good as mine. I would say, you know, first looking at the retention data, we're not really losing many players that come on and play a couple times. So even though Kickback was a much lower budget event, it was an experiment. It was fighters that most of our fan base didn't know because they they aren't league fighters yet. I think it shows that people enjoy up on the gaming. And even if it's not, Anthony Pettis versus Benson Henderson, they're going to play the game. I think we still did a really good job with marketing the event, like the title of the event, the graphics, all of that. I think we created a lot of hype around it. We got a tremendous amount of people who wanted to come to the event. We had to turn so many away, and then the cops turned hundreds away too. So all in, I think the marketing for the event was still very good. You know, we just got to keep finding new ways to acquire good users for the app. And as long as the retention stays stable, we should expect it to continue to grow over time. It clearly cannot grow at this rate every month. That would be almost mathematically impossible, especially since we're mostly marketing the app to Web3 users. Like you just run out of them at some point, you know, but I'm I'm very excited about like the product led growth initiatives that we have in the first half of the year. I think they'll be you know, much kind of more sustainable. And I can't wait to see them roll out. Well, you have to keep experimenting just like with any other business to, to see what works sure. and what doesn't. And, and I think overall, kickback number one worked really well. I do have one more question for you. It comes around the Influencers Fight Club. We've seen that yes. there's Karate Combat branding around this Influencers Fight Club. Is it going to be in the same pit as the next event? Is it going to be on the same live stream? Are people going to be able to yeah. do up and only gaming? How's this all going to work? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, so, it, uh, you know, we'll have eight to 10 karate combat fights like we always do at the numbered events. And then we're, we'll have five to six of these Web3 influencer fights. Uh, most, of the, most of the fights are already sketched out, and you can see it on Influencer Fight Club Twitter page. They'll either be before or after KC44, like right before, right after. I think they'll be live streamed both on our own channel and then on Crypto's R Us's channel, who organized this whole crazy thing. And we'll, it will definitely be included in Up Only Gaming. Well, you have some of the biggest influencers in this space. So, uh, again, talking about experimentation and getting new people in, yeah. it, it's certainly a good way to go. You guys are doing a great job. Uh, I appreciate every fight. I have a blast every single time. Good luck with your next event at Karate Combat 44 and for the rest of the year. Thanks, man.
I think what excites me most about Karate Combat is the, the size of their Web2 audience that already exists and thus the potential of converting those people over into Web3 and into the Hedera economy. But I'm also excited about the strides they're making in Web3 itself. Like I said, they've got that Web2 fan base, but they're really, really growing that pool of interest now within Web3, where, of course, is where that, you know, the current retail interest is, where the capital is, where the investors are, and so on. And so they've got in BitBoy, as, as mentioned, one of the biggest figures in, in Web3. You know, he's got a lot of con controversy around him, but there's no doubt about it that he will bring in an audience. And so I think if there are people that, and of course there are, that still don't know about Karate Combat, it's this kind of Web3 focused fight that will really bring in that attention, get a lot of people, you know, the memesters, but also the big names, the medium names and so on, looking at Karate Combat, seeing the model there, seeing the innovation there, and hopefully, you know, picking up themselves to cover and so on. Absolutely. Now, I do want to go back to something that we should have covered when we were talking about our developers, but we're going to have some more content coming out around this in the weeks to come. But that's that the Wallet Connect open source library has been made fully available. So for all of our developers out there, check it out, use it. It will make your life easier. And like I said, we're going to have some more information coming out about that in the weeks to come. And with that, we'll go ahead and get into some network analysis. So over the past week, Hedera has been averaging just under 1,400 transactions per second, totaling 820 million transactions for the week, with a peak of over 4,200 TPS. With our DeFi ecosystem remaining strong, we had over 700,000 smart contract calls, which equals about $35,000 in revenue. The average time to consensus is still below 3.2 seconds, and we had over 30,000 accounts created just in the last week. Looking at our fungible tokens, Wrapped HBAR takes the top spot, followed by the meme coin Unlucky, then Sauce, Karate, and the Energy Trade token. Dovu, Candy, USDC, HBAR Suite, and a new one that I have to look into, Tomb Security token, round out the top 10. And Zep, of course, the granddaddy of all of our fungible tokens is still going to be HBAR. And we had a new listing, right? Yeah, so HBAR has been listed in PDAX, which is one of the big exchanges in the Philippines. And as I understand, this is part of a, a sort of wider strategy for support of another project that we've heard of in the past. I, I, I'm not sure I'm at liberty to mention it yet, but this is part of a sort of wider ecosystem play. So it's definitely one to keep an eye out in the future. Absolutely. And let's take a look at our NFTs. Rant CPU still rules the NFT chart. As discussed in the past weeks, you can get yours free at rantcpu.lithos.com. Next up is the Saucer Swap Liquidity NFT, the Not a Slime World NFT, and the Road Code 2024 All Access card. Next up, we see a Karate Combat themed NFT from Karatika, a Tolem Earth non digital, non KYC token, just giving you all the information on that. The Tolem NFT should catch our attention. Tolem is one of our carbon credit marketplaces. They may just be testing or preparing, but we know how big the potential impact of refi can be on our network. So, of course, that we know how much work has been put into our refi ecosystem and seeing indications of progress on our mainnet is, is great to see. Next up, we have zero pixels and crazy pixels to round out the top 10. All right, Zeb, before we move on, do you have any thoughts on our NFT ecosystem? Yeah, well, I, as a dead pixels holder, got some great utility today in collaboration with Hedera Hashcoin, who we spoke at at the start of the show who sent out an airdrop of HHC to anyone that had associated the token that also owned a Dead Pixels. And so Dead Pixels was the first project. They put out an engagement post saying, whoever has the most active community in terms of commenting on this post will then get the next airdrop. So I think it was between Hangry and Kabila. That's what it looked like in the comments. So I would assume that if you are a holder of one of those and you associate the token when HHC say you'll also be eligible for that airdrop. So it's great to see a, you know, a, a Hedera token supporting the NFT ecosystem in that way and bringing greater value to you know, the NFT ecosystem. So that was top of mind for me for, for NFTs this week. Of course, Rant CPU are doing a great job. Um, but yeah, I'm sure next week we'll see more. 
Yeah, I love this idea of airdrops, and I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg when it comes to them within our ecosystem. But without further delay, we'll get into some DeFi. Taking a look at DeFi Llama, not including state or liquid staking, Hedera DeFi TVL is sitting at just over $76 million. SaucerSwap making up $73 million of that and continues to take market share. I'm still hoping to see HSuite represented on DeFi Llama pretty soon. Taking a look at some of the staking rewards on SaucerSwap's popular trading pairs, HBAR HBAR X version 1 is at 5%, HBAR Sauce version 1 is at 20%, and V2 is at 25%, HBAR USDC V1 is at 25%, V2 at 41%, and finally HBAR Karate is at 41%. Admittedly, I had a bad up-only gaming run, mainly because of those no contests in that last event, but still, even with only getting 4%, when you compound it, it's a nice return. Over on Heliswap, HBAR Heli is at 67%, 87% on HBAR USDC, and 32% on HBAR Karate. Moving over to the HBAR and crypto markets, Bitcoin was flat on the day, but up a few percent on the week. HBAR underperformed, down slightly on the day, and down nearly 8% on the week to about 6.9 cents at the time of recording. That said, we are sitting just above an area of strong support at 6.8 cents, but a strong crypto downdraft could see that break, which might allow a move down to 6 cents before any meaningful additional support. If we manage to bounce, we'll have to see what happens at 7 cents before potentially making a run at the next area of resistance at around 7.4 to 7.5 cents. All right, Zeb, that's pretty much all we have. Is there anything else you'd like to pass on? Yeah, I think this week is is all about deep in for me, you know, decentralized physical infrastructure networks. And we know that the Hedera consensus service is, you know, best in class for data integrity, for, you know, tracking these projects in the real world, things like supply chains and, and so on and so forth, or, you know, with drones, with, with Neuron. But we also know that the Hedera token service is its highly scalable equivalent in the domain of tokenization. And so we've got these great networks emerging like QuickPick. You know, we've also seen things like Avery Dennison that could be seen as a deep end. But now we have Neuron who've come out saying they are going to have this token economy, physical infrastructure that community can get involved in, you know, these kind of hotspots. So I really think Neuron is going to be one of those big plays for deep in, both because they have token incentivization, they have community input by running a hotspot, but they've also got those massive pilots with massive organizations and massive teams throughout, you know, the UK in particular, but, you know, stretching out into Europe now as well. So very excited for deep in on Hedera. I'm sure that's a narrative we'll see more about in the coming year. I think aviation is just the very tip of the iceberg for Neuron. They are looking at everything. I had really good conversations, of course, with, with their founder and he looks at helium and he sees all of the issues and he he's looking to fix all of those issues. Also really excited about what we heard it coming out of quick picks. It's a whole new way to do sharing economy. I'm really excited about that. Certainly go out there and participate in what Rob Allen, his Sharky token, and get your questions submitted for next week. I also have an update from SKUX next week. I think people are going to be really excited to hear what they have going on. Um, we're going to be doing a Twitter space next Tuesday, I believe, at 9 a.m. Eastern. That's going to be with DAP Radar. We're also going to get some of our favorite DAPs on that as well. That's all we have. We'll see you next week.